Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Leaders Hub series. I'm Aditya, and today we have with us the world's number one organizational culture thought leader and best-selling author, Arthur F. Kramazi. Arthur is ra- ranked as the world's top ten most influential thought leaders in leadership and organization culture by Global Gurus. As motivational keynote leadership speaker, best-selling author, the founder of Directive Communication Psychology. Arthur's brain clarity research and gamification method methodologies have influenced the training and leadership development industry through his unique neuroscience and game-based psychological approaches to leadership and corporate culture transformation. We're extremely honored to have him with us today. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Arthur, to begin with. You have over 25 years of experience uh, and being ranked as the number one leader in your field. Can you give give us a brief overview of how your journey has been and what has brought you to this level? Wow. Well, yes. I, I, okay, but it but my journey started with utter and complete failure. Um, so I mean, ultimately, at, at one point, um, I, I used to work for a, a large organization and. Um, and and in this organization, you know, I I I, I mean, I was a, a little bit young and uh, well, younger anyway. And I thought, oh man, I can do anything. I'm, I was very excited. In fact, you you remember when you first started working for an organization, and you know, you're like uh, you're thinking, wow, this is going to be awesome, and you're you're just really excited, and you're you know what's going to happen next year and the following year and so on, and you're really excited. Okay, well, I was very excited, and so I go into this company, and 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 at this time, I'm I'm going in as a department head. Head and I'm, you know, super excited. And that was good for about two weeks. And then I started noticing that other people around me, they're all blaming each other. And I'm like, oh man, you know, this is, I, cause I'm very positive. I know I can make a difference. Okay. I can handle this. I can make things happen. And then, you know, I, I, I come up with some really cool ideas. Have you ever had cool ideas? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and, and so I go and I talk to these people, these other department heads and say, hey, look, you know, we could, you know, you've got some resources and I've got some resources and we could kind of pull our resources. And they said, look, we understand you're new here, <laughs> but no, you were very busy and uh, you do your thing and we'll do our thing. And I'm like, oh man, no cooperation, but I knew I could make a difference. You know, four and a half months later, you know what happened? No clue. <laughs> uh, Without yeah. even realizing it, I started blaming people. Okay. Oh. And, you know, and, and then people, of course, would come up to me and they'd say, Hey, Arthur, you know, can you help me with this? And I'd say, Look, look, you do your thing. I'll do I, my thing. And, and what happened is that I, I ended up becoming an underachiever. I, I ended up getting sucked in to a, an environment or a culture that I didn't like. I didn't like being this person. And, and, you know, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, you know, you can do more? I mean, you know, you can be more. And and yet I, I just felt stuck. And at that time, I was in massive debt. So I really needed the money. I couldn't quit. <laughs> and so what happened um, one day, I mean, you know, it affected my life. It affected everything. And one day I just looked into the mirror and I thought, man, you suck. I mean, not you, but, you know, like in the mirror. Right. So and. and 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 I thought, okay, I, I've got to, you know, at least go and figure out what, what this problem is. And so I went and I talked to all these other people that were making my life difficult. And um, I found out something very unexpected. I found out that they were real human beings. <laughs> and they actually had very similar problems to me. And they actually had very similar emotions of be, feeling stuck and everything else and, and being sucked into the culture. And I thought, wow, okay, so... So it's not the people, it's the environment. And so ultimately, that's what kind of got me started trying to fix my own problem. I wanted to fix my problem. So I started doing research and, you know, being an underachiever, I was already kind of doing a lot of busy work anyway, you know. And um, so I, I started doing research on, you know, why somebody that has high potential, high energy, high ambition, basically becomes a total loser in a company that, uh, you know, that, that ultimately, um, where where they could be great. Okay. And, um, and, and why I wasn't really living up to my own potential. And, um, and so after about nine months, 
I started uh, uh, applying a lot of the things I learned, and we ended up uh, saving the company about uh, $17,000 a week in wastage. And, and that was, it was just simple. That was only between my department and two others. And, and the other departments didn't even know what I was doing. I was just kind of trying some of this stuff out. And that, that framework later on became the, um, what, the, the framework for directive communication psychology. And, and so I started, after that, I started writing some articles and uh, got in the newspapers. And then I got on radio, then I got on TV. And then people started calling me and saying, hey, can you do this for us? And then eventually I was able to quit my job. And uh, that kind of got me started on this journey. And, um, and ultimately, uh, later at one point, when uh, a, a few years later, after I had already developed a reasonable brand, I, I needed to franchise because this was a methodology that could be replicated where other people could do it. So um, I was still in debt. Uh, so I, I moved to Bali because at that time I was in Singapore and Bali of course gave me an opportunity to focus on on building things and you know lower labor costs and at the same time I didn't have to worry about you know things like washing clothes or or cleaning house or eating or or or, or food or anything and um and it was uh, I was able to uh, to 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 build the franchise, which now we have over 620 licensed directive communication psychology trainers and consultants in 28 countries. Wow, that's truly inspiring, Arthur. And this has been one of the best introductions. I'll give you that for sure. And uh, for sure, like I think I like especially like the part where you uh, went out and talked to people. I think uh, when you're working somewhere and you honestly don't enjoy the atmosphere when you decide to talk to people and just get get to them get to uh, clarity about the situation that can really help bring things uh, make for things positive so thank you absolutely for sharing. moving on Arthur uh, Arthur you talk, always speak about how leadership and organizational change go hand in hand and it's up to leaders to create a culture focus environment at work as an expert on the topic what steps can uh, leaders take to create an environment of cooperation and teamwork to boost performance. Okay, well, first of all, you have to understand that, okay, let, let, let's just look at a potential scenario. Let's say you have the CEO of Citibank, okay? Now, CEO of Citibank, they're doing a great job and you know they're bringing Citibank up to you know higher levels of profitability, et cetera. Now, let's say you've got the CEO of Google, okay? Mm -hmm. Google CEO doing the same thing, bringing the company up to higher levels of profitability and awesomeness, okay? Now, what happens if you swap them, okay? Citibank CEO goes and, and manages Google and vice versa. Will they do a good job? See, the, the, the culture of the organization needs to match the leader or the leader needs to match the culture either way, okay? But ultimately, one person can be a great leader in one culture and totally suck as a leader in a different culture. So, and I know that a lot of the a lot of my uh, my colleagues will say, "Oh, the the you know the leader at the top is the one that decides the the direction of the culture." And and while part of that is definitely true, and and definitely true in smaller companies, it's not the only thing. And. Um, by understanding, because the leader also is affected by the current organizational culture. People, uh, imagine, okay, just example. All right, you have friends, right? Yeah. Okay, so now, do you behave the same way with the, your group of friends that you do with your family? No. Okay, why? Okay, are, are you purposely trying to do something different or does each group simply bring out different facets of who you are, right? So see, we are connected to the environment, okay? So even if a leader goes into an organization and they've got all these great ideas and everything else, how the organization acts and reacts, okay, is going to affect that leader and vice versa. So anytime that you go into any type of an environment or group, you are affecting that group, but that group is also affecting you. So it is essential, first of all, to understand how and why that works. See, if you know how and why group dynamics affect you and affect everyone within that group, well, now you can make small tweaks that 
instead of being the leader to tell people or guide people or whatever, or serve people, um, you're creating an environment where people themselves are creating opportunities to be the people that they want to be. Because I'll tell you, you know, I mean, sometimes people think, oh, people are lazy and they, they just care about money and all this stuff. And, and honestly, it's it that the only time where people only care about money is when they have a job that they don't like. <laughs> Ultimately, if there is a situation where they're passionate, where they feel they have purpose, where they feel they're adding value, where they feel that they are truly making an impact and are with other people who are supporting and guiding and, and they're learning things along the way, well, you know, that that's very different. Then, then the money thing is secondary. And the thing is that a lot of times, uh, the leaders don't understand the environment and they don't understand how to make those small modifications. I mean, example, okay? You go out with your friends. Where do you go with your friends? Uh, to restaurants or to play a sport. Okay, okay. Well, let's say you go out with your friends to, uh, to, to play a sport, all right? So let's say it's that group of friends, all right? Yeah. Now, when you go out and you play a sport, uh, besides playing the sport, what do you talk about? How work has been, how my week went, or how my day went. Okay, girls. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. I can tell. Okay. <laughs> okay. So so you go, okay. So now when you're talking about these things, are like you super excited or are you just kind of like, you know, you know relaxed and stuff? Super excited. Yeah. Super excited. Okay. So now let's say you go play the same sport, you talk about the same things. Okay. But instead of being super excited, you're like kind of philosophical and you're like <laughs> you know, it, it, the 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 tone the energy is just it's just changing one thing the tone the like just just the energy of how you are speaking but everything else is the same would mm -hmm. it affect your friends would it affect how they react how they how, how they talk to you and and would it affect what they say even yeah it would yes it would and see that's the thing one small modification can change an entire environment. And when you, when you understand what modifications to make, you can literally create environments that support individuals to take on leadership roles to support each other to be the best that they can be. And nobody says who the best is. And it's not like a, a guideline, oh, you, this is what you should be. Because ultimately, you know, we have our own ideas of what we want to become. And, and this is where a lot of times people forget what we want to become is usually pretty good. I mean, we uh, sometimes our stand often our standards are higher. Our own standards for ourselves are higher than the standards that other people have for us and creating an environment where we can create an ideal working environment where people support each other to achieve this is a key factor in the leadership enriched culture very well said Arthur. especially the part where you bring out the practical examples of how actually our, we notice that in our daily lives or how we act differently in between different groups of people and that's how we truly are as human beings that the group that we are surrounded by and the people that we are surrounded by is is actually determine does determine how we behave that's very well put and thank you for opening our eye and our audience's minds to that uh, moving on to the third question, in your show, The Knights of Transformation, you share an interesting approach to show em to how employees can get motivated at work. As leaders, what steps should we implement to follow this approach and make sure our employees are happy at work? Okay. Well, first of all, in that specific, uh, I think you're referring to the work gamification uh, article. Okay. <laughs> so here's... Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff to do, but one of the things that a lot of that that is going to that especially works now is work gamification. Now, the problem is that most people don't know what work gamification is, and they think it's like playing games or something like that. And even if they create some kind of reward ki kind of thing, well, it, it usually ends up backfiring because they don't understand the scope 
of the entire psychology of how to maintain um, interest and motivation across the board. See, anytime you create anything like a leaderboard, okay, by itself, what's going to happen is that there's always going to be that group of people that's always going to be on top, okay? And that's really cool for the group of people that's on top, but it's not necessarily cool for everybody else. And everybody else is like, whatever, you know, we'll just kind of go ahead, let them take the glory again. Okay. And so therefore people just get demotivated. Okay. So that kind of sucks. Now, the other thing though, is that um, <laughs> a lot of times gamification is connected to performance reviews, which are at best quarterly. OK, or it's maybe connected to KPIs. Oh, you've achieved this KPI and you've achieved these KPI, which, again, takes a long time. OK, and, you know, that used to be really cool 20 years ago, um, but it's not anymore because we're not that patient. Now we have instant message. We have instant gratification when you post something on Instagram. OK, I mean, it's like, oh, my gosh, I got like 100 likes for posting my cat. OK, you know, I mean, everybody is getting all these um emotional gratifications instantly from everything okay so people start to do these initiatives they do i mean uh, example okay i mean just you know the there uh we 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 approached a potential client um for a culture change program okay and it turns out that this client had already started their culture change program like 2 years ago right and they're oh but it's going well it's like <laughs> It's like, if it's already two years, it's not going well because, uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, if you don't do something fast, people are going to check out. I mean, with our culture change program, people see visible big results in two weeks. OK, and, and that's what keeps them excited. And it's the same thing with gamification. You have to have instant gratification. You have to have the ability to see and measure your progress and get feedback so that you can actually be better. So what is work gamification? First of all, it is literally performance measurement. OK, but performance measurement that is fun and kind of themed and kind of exciting. OK, so. If you reinvent the idea of performance measurement rather than uh, connecting it to specific KPIs, specific objectives, and you look at what those, let's say, for example, let's look at the objectives that you have, all right? So within a specific objective, there are certain KPIs. Now, it is it stands to reason that if you know what the KPI is, that you will also be able to reverse engineer that KPI into behaviors. OK, if you do this, this and this, you will achieve this KPI, right? Makes sense, right? OK, mm -hmm. so the thing is that, see, KPIs can be measured maybe once every two, three months. Behaviors can be measured every single day. Right now, the thing is that you also have negative behaviors that are counterproductive to achieving that KPI, which can also be measured. <laughs> So if you gamify the behaviors that will ultimately achieve those objectives, now you've got something where you can literally in less than 20 seconds create a data point, okay? And you can use WhatsApp. We've created an app called Squadly um, that is literally designed for performance uh, or for behavior gamification. And um, so this, uh, the idea is that once you have this, basic foundation of, first of all, understanding what behaviors you need, then you are able to go ahead and create positive and negative emoji related to that. Okay. And of course, you can also give awards. But on top of that, one of the key factors, you have to have a resurrection point. Okay. You know how in games, you know, like maybe a shooter game, you like bam, 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 and then bam, you die. Uh, okay. And so then you, you, you don't stay dead you get resurrected. But now you are resurrected with new wisdom. Ah, if I turn right, I will die. So next time I should turn left. Well, it's the same thing with performance, right? If I 
end up not making the top 10 list or the top 50 list or, or, or uh, something on, on one of the behaviors or anything, then I am not going, then I know that I need to maybe modify this in order to get there the next time. So if you have a resurrection point of, let's say every week, you start over, it's, it's a clean slate. Everybody has a chance to win because now it's like, oh, okay, these people that maybe these people were ahead of the point of, of the, uh, you know, for, for a while last week, but now I have a chance because we're starting over and now I know what to do. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you have to give multiple opportunities for people to win. So maybe you've got like the main point, okay, uh, for the individual. And then you've got like little sub points, like some of the, the specific behavior. So maybe you're, you know, you're, uh, you're not on the main list, but you might be great on the inno innovative thinking list, for example. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, with gamification uh, is that it's can't because you remember, you have to give a lot of opportunities to win. So you can't just make it about individuals. It's also the team has to be included. So maybe you don't win as the individual, but you win, maybe the team wins. Okay. And then also, there's also the whole level of the organization, right? So if you benchmark your culture, okay, and there's a tool for that also called the uh, the uh, culture evolution tool, okay? And, um, and, and so the culture evolution, well, assessment basically helps you to benchmark your organizational culture, which means that now you can see ah, next month or, or maybe after two months, you know, we've evolved our culture to this point. So everybody gets a chance to win as an organization. Hey, everybody's there. This is what you have contributed to. Because gamification is all about measurement. And then when you theme it, when you make it, you know, when you tie all these points and all these little things and awards and everything to some kind of maybe a theme, like could be superheroes or, you know, like dun, 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 DC psychology uh -huh. superheroes. Okay. Um, or it could be uh, something related to uh, secret agents or I don't know, manga. I mean, there's, you know, we've worked a lot of companies. They, some people have got sports teams, all kinds of stuff. So it's just, themed to make it unique to make it fun to so mm -hmm. that it kind of at least for that moment takes you out of reality and puts you into a different place wow that's truly inspiring after especially how i really like how you try like the leadership programs that you build are based out of things that we humans naturally do for example uh, how we look for that small dopamine effect when we post something on instagram and using and using that same emotion to build a leadership program that measures performance. That is truly insightful. Thank you for sharing that with us, Arthur. Thank moving you. On to, moving on to our fourth question. Uh, you have great experience and expertise in specializing in psychological approaches to leadership and culture. And we've honestly seen that in how you, and in the answers till now. So uh, you've de developed the directive communication methodology. Can you tell us how leaders can apply this methodology in organization to ex achieve exceptional results? Absolutely. Okay. So, well, DC, DC psychology or directive communication psychology is a science of group dynamics, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that means that basically um, if you're by yourself, it's not, it's not a thing. Okay. But how you act and react with other people and how you can understand those actions and reactions or why and how those reactions happen so that you can influence those environments. That's what directive communication is. So it's a body of work of different models that help you to know why and how people do what they do in groups. And so ultimately, um, by understanding this, uh, and 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 we do this all the time. We'll go into an organization uh, that needs to that maybe is having a problem with their team. We can we or or wants to create a team. We can predict whether a team with within like literally a, a, a seven minute interview with somebody will be able to predict um, with or uh, with pretty good accuracy whether that team will succeed or fail. Okay, whether it'll be a high performing team and think about this, right? You've had people where you've got like a super high performing team and you bring in a super high performer and you put them into the team and then the entire team just falls apart. Okay, 
you've had that, you've seen that. Or sometimes you have a mediocre team and you bring in another mediocre person and suddenly the entire team becomes a high-performing team, okay? It is predictable. It is completely predictable. So the, the thing is that DC psychology, um, I, I, okay, well, I'll just give you an idea. One of the models inside of DC psychology is the colored brain, which is our, our most popular model, okay? Now, the colored brain deals with the brain's ambiguity relief process, okay? So the ambiguity relief process is a genetic way that you, your brain gets clarity. Now, here's the thing, okay? Um, you, uh, you're born with this, you can't change it. It's how you get clarity, right? So that means if I am, uh, let's say for example, chaotic processing, which means that in order for me to get clarity, I need to take action or at least come up with action or ask questions or, or just kind of move on stuff, right? So that means that that element of, of clarity for me is going to be very different than somebody who essentially needs structure and needs to find or create or, or put structure together in order to get clarity before they take action. Now think about this, okay, you've got one guy that needs to take action to get clarity and another guy that needs clarity before they take action, there's going to be some conflict there, right? And there's going to be misunderstanding. And because there's misunderstanding, you know, you're, you're going to judge people, okay? And because you're judging people, then you're going to create these barriers to trust and potentially even respect, okay? And so therefore, what ends up happening is that sometimes people, depending on who's where, okay, in the hierarchy, you get people that are going to go, okay, you know what? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay. Because they, 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 they are accidentally, okay, judged because their process, their way of doing things, their how is not the same as the person who basically is in charge or maybe the team leader or whatever. And so, therefore, that creates barriers to being yourself, to being the best that you can be, which, of course, also demotivates you, takes away your engagement. And, of course, well, that kind of has an effect on the overall environment because, you know, the energy that you're kind of, you know, emanating is also affecting the other people around you. Now, if you understand, that, for example, okay, I was like, you have brown eyes. If I came up to you and said, you know what? I don't like brown eyes. You should have blue eyes. Okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, you might think that was pretty silly. Okay. But let's say that you wanted to please me. Okay. And you went out and you got some blue eyed contact lenses. Now, what color are your eyes? Uh, black or dark brown, I think. Okay, so I mean, but your 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 eyes are still going to be brown, even if you have blue eyed contact lenses, right? You can't actually change it. It's not that it's a it's genetic. You can't change it. Mm -hmm. So because it's because you can't change it, it is a lot easier to accept. Okay, I can accept that you have brown eyes. So even if I want you to have blue eyes, you know, I just deal with it. And because I, I deal with it, that means I can now manage my own expectations. Because now I know that you, you know, have a special way or a specific way of processing, of, of getting clarity, rather than expecting you to get clarity in my way, okay, I can support you to get clarity in your way so that we can synergize, so I can set you up for success instead of failure. That's extremely insightful. Thank you for sharing that with us, Alfred. As a unique way of looking at how we how we can deal with our problems, actually, even at work or outside work, and I think our audience can is going to use that and really benefit from that. Moving on to the last segment of our interview, Arthur, do you have any advice for the emerging leaders on our platform, and how can people who are interested contact you or reach out to your company to enroll to your coaching program? Wow. Well, first of all, I mean the can. Uh, a advice would be, first of all, there's no such thing as a leadership model, okay? Um, there's only the ideal leadership identity that you have for yourself, okay? Yeah. People are going to take you to these trainings where they, oh, in order to be a good leader, you should be like this and do this and do this and do this. And, you know, I, I, if you've ever been to that kind of leadership training, sometimes you think, wow, that's really great. And you try to be that. And then it's just hard. It's just difficult to maintain. So what happens is eventually you just go back to be doing what you were doing before and you just kind of lose the momentum. But see, rather than trying to be something you're not, 
if you can actually bring out the best parts of who you are, because see, in some environments, maybe when you're with your friends, or maybe when you're under stress, or maybe when, you know, you're with a, a person that you care about, you know, you, th there are certain facets of who you are that come out that are natural leadership in tendencies, okay, and that is where you can elevate those, bring those out, refine them, and create your own ideal leadership identity. So that's one thing, okay? Now, for bringing, as far as uh, coming together and, and joining, our, our, we have online programs called The Hero's Way. Um, you can come to, uh, you can reach me at arthurc at Um uh, If you want to ask me some questions, uh, you want to get uh, Colored Brain certified, you can go to coloredbrain.com. Um, if you want to learn about uh, organizational culture, uh, you can go to cultureevolution.com or uh, culturechange.academy. Okay, so these are different places that you can go to get different ideas and different things. And uh, of course, the uh, uh, if you want to learn about work gamification, you can get the uh, uh, my latest book, Game On: Reinventing Organizational Culture with Gamification, on Amazon. Wow. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you for sharing that with us. As you go, I have I have a final question personally from my side. Uh, okay. Since you seem like a very cool and a person with great ideas, do you have any short, any small anecdote that you'd like to share with us? Something that you've been through, or something that you saw in someone, or a unique thing that you learned from a situation that you had no idea you'd learn from? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, really quick. Um, sometimes you're and you don't realize it okay <laughs> I, I know it's true i i used to be such a you know and 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 you but but it, fortunately um you know there were people that helped me to see that uh around me and um and it's important to surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth okay and and and, and more importantly it's important for you to actually listen when people tell you stuff OK, especially when more than one pe person tells you, you know, um, if you're in a leadership position, people will tend to tell you what you want to hear. And that's not useful. It may support your ego, but ultimately um, it's not going to help you to really become a better leader or a better person or a better husband or wife. Um, it is going to basically maintain your. OK, and um, uh, and, and that's that, that that's something that is that, that I think that. Um, if you just take a look at yourself, are you the person that you want to be? If you were your best friend, would you respect yourself? I mean, that, I guess that's the thing. That's wonderful. That's great advice, Arthur. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for joining us in this Leader Talk series. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to have you with us. And that is it from our side. This was the Leader Talk series. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure.